gentlemen. Hi, great to be here today. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is practice performance and maybe some simple drivers that affect the profitability of dental practices. So, I think I heard one of the earlier speakers say that 2013 was one of the most difficult years uh, for dentistry as a business. And I think, to summarise that very quickly, you know, economy, manufacturing, any, any issues in Australian manufacturing come to life recently? Any cars or planes or any of those things getting into trouble? Mining, how's the mining business going? Infrastructure and mining, China slowing down, Africa selling cheaper minerals. A billion dollars of funding was removed in that scheme that the earlier speaker spoke about. So, so dentistry in Australia dropped 6% last year as a whole industry in terms of funding into dentistry. And what about competition? More graduates, more hygiene and therapists graduating and more abilities. So quite a lot of stuff happening that does make it a tough thing, a tough industry, a tougher industry. What we're going to talk about today is really some simple things that will really make a big difference. And I think I saw what was the revenue drop that Dental Corp had last year? Was what I see 10% or 8%, something like that. These drivers will change that. Okay, so a revenue model, five success factors, two case studies, and hopefully some questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw on 400 consultancies that we've done and some quite large data samples. So what I've said is evidenced by 400 consultancies and um, some other quite big data samples. Okay, so here's the model. Are you ready? Practice revenues are determined by the number of hours you work multiplied by Anyway, that's it. So let's take a look at that. Okay, believe it or not, the average dental practice in Australia only bills about 80% of the hours that the professional is available to work. So quite often, I'll ask somebody, you know, what, what do you think your chair utilisation will be? And I, in fact, I did this to somebody with somebody on Wednesday. I was at a user group meeting. And said, so, you know, uh, what's, what's the uh, utilisation? The person said, 99%. What did they just tell me? I don't know. Yeah, right. So what I can tell you is that 95% is best of class. And a small number of practices achieve 95%. 90 is more difficult. And 80 is the average. What about hourly rate? In Australia, the hourly rate is about $300 an hour, but there is quite a wide standard distribution. So if that's not quite the hourly rate, there is quite a big variation there. When times are good and a practice revenue is increasing, one of those two dimensions must be moving outwards. What happened in 2013? One or both of those must have moved inwards. Why, why would that happen? What drives that? Oh, and by the way, a shift of just 10% revenues could account for a 30% profitability change. Why would that be? What's the nature of the expense structure in a practice? It's pretty fixed. So bottom line, top line, becomes bottom line. Okay. But how big is the typical variation between two practices? Let's say I'm walking down the road. I've got practice A on my left. I've got practice out on the right. Member of the public, I can't really tell the difference. What would be the typical hourly rate variations between, what could be the hourly rate variations? Up to 100%. And you're kind of thinking maybe orthodontics, maybe other specialties, maybe Botox. Hold that thought and we'll come back to that. Okay, so typically the kind of outputs of the consultancy tends to be between sixty and hundred thousand dollars. So let's look at success factor number one. Utilization of provider time. So average practice utilization is typically 77 to 80 percent. Typical best case is about 95. If you think you're at 99, what are you telling me? Don't know. Okay, what does the gap in your day mean? 
What's the uh, thinking behind this? A tea break. Hey, don't stress. You know, we don't have to be too full in this practice. We quite like a break. Yeah, Starbucks could get those margins. That's a very expensive cup of tea, right? The first thing is you've got to take an attitude that that is revenue loss and that that needs to be addressed. Okay, there's only three reasons that, that, that you are not 100% utilised. A patient does not turn up. A patient cancels with sufficient, insufficient notice that you can refill that space and the time is never blocked. That's it, right? Simple. Okay, fail to attend. You know, I came across an American speaker and they said from the platform, don't remind patients. It trains them to rely on you. What else does reminding patients do? Oh yeah, it halves the fail to attend rate. So if you send an email out at about four or five days and you send a text message out at about 24 hours or inside 24 hours, your fail to attend rate will go from 5% to about 2.5% compared to somebody who does nothing. Now telephoning patients is a great idea. That works really well. Two problems though, it's very expensive. And actually, it's hard to get every patient on the top. Short notice cancels. If you remind a patient at four to seven days, somewhere out there, four, five, six days, they quite likely will cancel at that moment. Oh, yep, that's right. Go to the dentist. Oh, no, I'm not. Then you've got four or five days to refill the slot. Much easier. But you know, sitting here today, what do we know about short notice cancellations? They will happen. Why not have a list of people whom you have asked if they would like to fill a short notice gap? Some patients will say no. Some will say yes, have a short notice gap. Okay, now, although what we're going to talk about today is all principle based, some software products, and this is a copy of Exact, can help you with this. So, it will prompt you for any appointment that you book in two to three weeks in the future. Ask the patient if they would like to go on the list. Would they like a sooner appointment? You say yes, put them on the list. Hold the mouse on the gap. The gap then gives you a list of perfect patients for that gap. Push send SMS. It will send the patients an SMS one by one. As we discussed, I now have a gap this afternoon at 2pm. Reply confirm if you would like that gap. Get the text back, computer reads it, computer shifts their appointment, out of the future, puts it in today. Writes back to them, thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you at 2pm. Second patient writes back. I'd like the appointment too. Computer writes back and says, terribly sorry, the time is now gone, but I shall send you another opportunity soon. Okay, success factor number two. Patient recall and reactivation. If you send a patient, so the definition of success here, of, of effectiveness, is I send a recall, and as a result of that recall, the patient books an appointment. Nice easy definition. If you send a patient one letter, half of the patients will book an appointment, more or less. In a year where patients are less confident, that'll go down, less economically confident, that'll say. In a year that they're more confident, it'll rise, but it's about half. So 2013, it did sag, as far as we can measure. It dropped by about 10%. If, however, you send a patient three reminders, and I don't mean at 9am, then at 12am, and then at 5am, 30 days apart, and you use a mixture of media, so a mixture of email, text messages, and physical post, you will typically get an 80% return. Quite a big difference. What would 30% more patient traffic out of the recall system do for the average practice? Quite a bit. Now the graph here also comes out of version 11 exact. Down the left-hand side are the months. 
So that's a few years there, right? The little graph there, February, that's, that's the time that's taken. So February's today, if you like. As I go forward, the bright green, those are the future recalls. So recalls in the future months. As I go back, the blue are where patients had a recall, they've come in, they've attended, the recall's been moved forward. That's perfect. The bright red are where they have a recall, and they still have a recall, and it's no appointment. That's what 50% looks like. That's the average. Doesn't look so great when you see it graphically, but that's the average. So three messages, mixed media. Now, the messages need to show concern for the patients, but if a patient does get three appropriately spaced messages with messages of concern, what do they think? <coughs> Somebody cares about me. It's not a bad idea, it's a great idea. Okay, and here's how well the media works. <clears throat> a typical traditional piece of mail still works pretty well. Funnily enough, I don't know if you have the same experience as me, I get less letters these days. I get a lot more stuff electronically. Physical mail, ironically, probably works better than it did. I didn't measure it 10 years ago, so I don't know. But it definitely works well today. Text messages work well today. Emails are an important part of the blend, but I wouldn't rely on them as a sole medium. Here's how we would recommend that you set up a typical recall system. One month before the recall is due, the first preference is an SMS. If the patient has no mobile, send them an email. If they have no email address, send them a letter. The month that is due, an email or text message. One month after, a physical letter, email, SMS, and so on. Where a patient has a mobile and an email address, all seven communications cost $1.56. Fully costed. $1.56, seven communications. Very easy, very effective. What's the beauty of the 36 month recall reminder? It's not really a recall reminder anymore, is it? It's what I call a reactivation. The practices who set this up, Often they come back and they say, actually, I want a 48 month and a 60 month. What happens when a patient comes back in and they haven't seen us for 60 months? How much restoration work do they carry? They're as good as a new patient. From a pure financial point of view. I apologize if I, um, I am just talking about a financial model. Okay, here's another model. Now this, this screenshot was captured from a, a real practice. And the practice said to me when I talked to them, and the reason I took the screenshot, think in our practice, Brian, we don't really need to run recalls. No patient gets past the front desk without booking the next appointment. Right? Either they're in a treatment plan, and we book the next appointment in that treatment plan, <coughs> or I'm booking their next recall. No one leaves. Does anyone think that that's physically possible? It's not, right? You can't book every patient. Some patients will say, no, haven't got my diary, can't do it today, call me. What you notice is, so the green part of this, the dark green, is when I have a future recall date and a booked appointment. The light green case is when I just have a recall date, no appointment. So I can actually see the effectiveness of that. In this particular case, for the practice that assured me that every patient got an appointment, it's about half, which is not untypical. It's difficult to get every patient, no matter how determined front desk are, they can be a fabulous team. It's hard to get every patient in. So the moral of that story is run recalls as well. Still run a full recall system, no matter how good you think you do that. Because all of that green, the light green, becomes red if you don't. Okay, online booking. Does anyone here book appointments online? A couple of people? Okay, does it work? Well, it depends what you do with it. Here's what we would do. When you send out an email recall, have a button on that says book online. A nice big button. Under that button, 
it contains the data of who the patient is, who the dentist is, and what they need. So if they need a dental hygiene, it knows all that. If they need 30 minutes, it knows that. If they need 15 minutes, it knows that. The patient doesn't think about that. The patient clicks on the button, they immediately get the booking engine. It then confirms three mouse clicks and they're done. Really, really easy. It turns out about half of all the appointments booked through the booking engine are done after office hours. Patients quite like to get the email and do it later. It works really well. So let's pull that all together so far. So I send a patient a first recall. Now I should have also mentioned that with the recall system, full automation is available to do all of that. So that grid I showed, that's taken out of the automation system. So that first recall, computer sends the patient first recall. Half the patients will book an appointment. Half will not. We send a second and third. We hope that some of those patients will book online. We will send them a confirmation email. Four days before, we send a reminder. 24 hours before we send a reminder. Now, if we invite our patients with a text message to reply, yes, I'm still coming, positive confirmation, that 5% that goes to 2.5% goes to a 1% if they positively reply. Not all patients will positively reply. So all seven of those communications can take place without anybody being involved. Why is that a good idea? Now some people say it saves money. It's more efficient. Won't be my receptionist anymore. I don't think so. The reason is, I've seen a lot of very hard-working and excellent reception teams and practice managers, but they cannot communicate with one patient, every patient, seven times. It's not possible. The patients like communication. Yeah, I mean, it's the Pope Catholic. Of course they do. Okay, so, Mount Wyoming Dental. Allows us to automate reminders, blah, 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 significantly free up our support staff, valuable benefits of the practice, optimal timing and practice for patients. Previously, we spent up to two hours a day, never touched the computer. Patients appreciate the ability to receive reminders. We've seen good improvements of patient bookings for regular checkups, thanks to the SMS. Alleviate pressure and reception, much more customer focus, operates like clockwork. Fully automated, very easy, significantly improved. FTA rates are greatly improved. Working really well, runs itself, improves our cash flow. First day, amazingly, the gap was full in less than a minute. How amazing. Does anyone get the feeling that patients are not responding to their recalls? Anyone ever had that? Here's a possible cause. How do I know that? We run a call centre. People call us, we give them technical help. Sometimes we have to call them back. We only call back during office hours, sort of nine to five. Occasionally we take out our ballpoint pen, didn't get through, got through, didn't get through, got through. Turns out 44% of calls that we make to practices don't get answered. 6% no answer. 18% get a busy signal. 20% get an answer machine. If you're inside a practice and you're working really hard, how do you know who's not getting, getting through? When should practice managers and receptionists take lunch? Same time as their patients. What's the time the patient's going to call? We're thinking about it. What are the solutions? What can we do? How can we help? Okay, email, SMS, online booking. All the electronic media just helps take a bit of pressure off. It just makes the job a bit easier. The phone still rings though. Get someone to mystery shop the telephone. Every month, get them to make so many calls to the practice just to check, just to tell you where you're at. Something like that. Or do it yourself. Uh, something like that. And 47% of the calls are online. 
do, do appointments get booked online? I think they do. Yeah. That's about 500 practices. How many people here get online booking? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, a few people. 6,000 of those, about two thirds, came from recalls. Okay, number three, hourly rate. It's pretty easy for the front desk to generate a 20% increase in hourly rate without talking to a dentist. Okay? So there's a lot of really great stuff that a dentist can do in the surgery talking to patients to increase hourly rate. Great. No argument, that's not what I'm talking about. Report like this out of their practice management system. I'm sure you all have. Print out a list of fees, by percentages. The first thing to notice is, if I look at the list of fees, the top 10 account for like 80 plus percent of my revenue. So if I'm going to do a fee review or I'm going to think about the operation of my practice financially, I don't really need to think about 200 treatment codes. The list is, this is a pretty simple exercise. I don't need reams of data. This is not very difficult. Now, I apologise, this is English data, so these are panels. So, let me compare those two high street practices, one on the left and one on the right. One of these practices, the gross fees are about £200,000. The practice on the other side of the street, it's about £400,000. We don't need to look at 10 codes, let's look at two. Top two codes. £52,000 versus one hundred and sixteen. Okay, 145 crowns. The other thing they did was they charged five pounds more per comps phone. So, basically, if you take the top 10 codes, they're typically made up, in a sort of a typical high street practice, of high volume, low margin items. Typically, that result from maintenance visits, examinations, x-rays, and composite fillings. <clears throat> and then there's the other side of the coin, which is lower volume, high margin items, crowns, bridges, implants, restorative work. It's not exactly rocket science to understand, therefore, that a few dollars more on the high volume items and a few more of the items on the others on, on the high value items. But how do I get the high value items? How do I do that? At this point somebody put their hand up in one of my Lectures and they said, you're not telling me to put a crown on where I should put a filling in, are you? No. But, new patients and the reactivations are a great idea. Which of those two is easier? Reactivations are much easier, right? <laughs> Emergency appointments. So I noticed on the diary from the previous speaker, they put up their day, and I think we were looking at um, root canal treatments, I think. But I couldn't help noticing a reserve time for emergency appointments. Right? Great idea. Financially, it's a great idea, because emergency appointments always come with restoration work, and sometimes quite valuable restoration work. At what time do you let go of those gaps? There's a magic answer. It's 9.30 a.m. Why is that? You get out of bed, you have toothache, you call the dentist by 9.30 a.m. 9.30 a.m. Most of those calls are done. Now, it took us a couple of hundred data sets to analyse that. But I think most practice managers in the room, oh yeah, <laughs> you know, we knew that. Okay, so 9.30 a.m., start running the utilisation tools to fill any gaps in the rest of the day. Because it's much less likely that an emergency gap will be filled after 1938. It's less likely. Okay. Unaccepted treatment plans. A quick telephone call. Hello, calling from the dental practice. Uh, I noticed that Dr. Smith uh, talked to you about a crown a couple of days ago. Would you like me to book you in? What are they going to say? Yes? No? I've got a question. It's got a question. Dr. Smith will call you right back. Dr. Smith is now talking to somebody who's probably going to book that appointment. But the yes and the no 
qualify that out very easy. <coughs> so interestingly, we just started to make some calls for practices on this basis. How many of those calls result in appointments? Anyone know? Anyone do the calls? Uh -oh. About a third. About a third of the people will say, yes, I'll book. Something like that. Use a smile assessment. What's a smile assessment? People use a smile assessment? Hands up. Okay, yeah, a few people. Okay, now I sent this to an audience on Wednesday and someone said, oh, patients would never like that idea. I'm not suggesting that you head it up with a title smile assessment. On the bottom of the medical questionnaire, draw a line and then have a couple of other questions. Something like, do you have any questions about adult braces? Would you like to know anything about tooth whitening? Do you have any gaps or chips that you would like to discuss with the dentist? The medical questionnaire then comes into the surgery. They look at the medical questionnaire, ask any questions about that. Ah, what is it? What gap or chip would you like to talk to me about? Let's have a look. That's a very easy conversation now. Very easy. Okay. Most practice management systems will contain something like a million dollars of unaccepted treatment plans. Assuming that that's not a brand new installation. Assuming that installation has been there for five, ten years, there'll be something like that. How many practices we got? Yeah, that's a lot, isn't it? How do you get to that? Well, the main thing is don't let it accumulate. As patients come out, let's get a phone call going and let's get them back in. New patients are pretty important, aren't they? Again, there's kind of a slightly magic number. It's about 20 new patients a month. About one a day is needed to maintain the average full-time dentist. Now, not completely consistent. If my practice is next to the airport or a railway station, I will need a lot more. If I'm in a very stable community where people never move, I'll need a few years. But something like that. The principal dentist needs to see the new patients and take some time. How many people do a 15 minute new patient exam? I'm just going to put hands up. Okay, not enough time, right? Open ended question, smile system. What's the biggest source of patient referrals for dental court? What should that be? Word of mouth? Yeah, but what should number two be? Say again? Health fund, booper? Yeah, booper, okay, all right. Definitely booper. What's number three? <coughs> what their number two and three. Who can put their hand up and say, I know what it is. I know what my number two and three is. Okay, so really important to know. What if Google's not your number, I'm going to say three now, but I was going to say two. What if that's not, what if Google's not your second source of patients after boot up yet, if we have mouth? Because where are the patients? Someone else is getting your new patients. I've heard dental, dental partners are really good at this. Yeah? I don't know if they are or not. I'm making that up. All right. But, it's something, but someone's getting them. Somebody's got to figure it out. Go back and Google your town, wherever you come from. Find out who's top of that list. That's where the new patients go. That's how it works. It's not difficult. Okay, patient flow. Number four. A perfect day every day. How many recalls should a principal dentist do? How many maintenance appointments? Some people would say none. It's a personal choice. Whatever that blend is, get the right blend. High value restorations, new patients, reactivations, emergencies, and recalls. And wouldn't it be great to get 95% of the time billed? How do you do that? A concept called forward cover. In six weeks from today, how full is your book? That's what I would call forward cover. How full should the book be? 
What about a three weeks helpful should it look be? Two great questions. At three weeks, I think it should be mostly full. At six weeks, I think it should be half full. Why? What if you are 90% full at six weeks out? What patient books six weeks in advance? What are they coming in for? Restoration work? Crowns and bridges? Not so much. It's going to be recall appointments. What do we know about recall appointments? They don't generate high margins. Too many recalls. What do you do if that's your situation? Some people love it. I feel really secure. My book is completely full. No one can get in here. I feel great. What do I do about this? Well, you've got two choices. Grow. And the problem is you can't, of course, the problem is you can't actually schedule restorations up. Someone comes in, they actually, you know, they're going to take, oh, you know, there's a, a ton of work to do in here, there's some really good implants, really good stuff, and I can't do it because I, I'm going to have to ask them to come back in six weeks. That's no good. Hygiene growth. Or if you say, you know what, oh, I'm done with growth, I don't know anymore. Associates are hygienists. Slow down the recall system. What's the scientific evidence for a six month recall? I don't know. I think Colgate made it up. Drive your utilization at the right level. So, 50% for three weeks. What's the problem with a diary that looks like that? Now, again, I met a very successful principal dentist who said, I love my associates to look like this because it puts them under pressure to sell restorations and get them in. Otherwise, the day gets empty. I don't like to have too many recalls in there. But what's the issue? It doesn't work very well. It creates a lot of pressure on reception, doesn't it, to fill the diary. Now, you remember one of our three causes was never booked. Now, the never booked part of the empty day tends to be little gaps. It's often not big gaps. And the reason you get little gaps is because you're under too much pressure to get the appointments beautifully stacked. Best one in the world, the last minute, I'll put anything in the gap. No short notice management. What do I mean? My short notice list is empty. I've got a gap, someone cancels this afternoon, I can't fill it. I've got nothing to work with. I need to have patience. I need to have some patience ready to have a gap. So, three week cover enables the short notice get list to work. If you empty at three weeks, you're short, you don't have a short notice list, that will lower the utilisation to date because you've got nothing to work with. Excessive six week cover probably indicates that there is a dollar per hour issue. Okay, so drive, drive up three week cover. New patients, think about search engine optimizations, refer event programs, reactivations of patients who have not attended for three, four, five years. Recalls, three follow ups. We took a, a, another sample of about 250 practices and we charted recall sent versus recall seen. We expect it to see it saturate, but it doesn't. The more recalls you send, generally speaking, you can schedule them into today and close up the gap. You become more efficient. Not entirely, and not for the person booked it at six weeks, 90%. That's what we're thinking about. Have a short notice list. Urgency times, but let them go at 9.30 a.m. Run the utilisation tools, or think about utilisation, closing up gaps at 9.30 in the morning and 4 p.m. for the next morning before the emergency gaps will let go. Okay, finally, build systems. First thing is, you need to have a framework that you are working to. What do I mean by a framework? I mean utilisation versus hourly rate. I mean three reasons that you're not utilised. I mean hourly rate is composed of two dimensions. High volume, low margin, low margin, high volume. What happens if you don't work to a framework? If you don't structure a set of metrics that fit together? What's the issue? I've seen many really well meaning, hard working practice teams drive up things like recalls, 
only to lower the hourly rate. You've got to figure out the payment. You've got to have a model. The model I've put up is a great one. It works really well. You've got to review the metrics as a team on a regular basis. If you're not measuring something, you are not improving it. If you think that you can run a better practice without measuring things, that isn't true. Who runs a regular practice, in, a regular meeting in their practice, weekly or fortnightly or monthly, where they record a list of actions, they assign them to the person, and in the next meeting they're back through the list and make sure the list is closed down? Who does that? Okay, I'm going to say about a third. Great job, guys. That's good. Written measurable goals are good. Get help. There's plenty of people to help with this stuff. Ourselves, but many other people also. People often say, no, oh, Brian, I know all this. You're not telling me anything new. There's nothing profound on the board. Ah, well, here's a thought. When you get back to the practice, check your numbers. If you're 80% utilised, you're not doing it. If you've got 50% recall effectiveness, you're not doing it. If you've got 5% failure, you're not doing it. Check the numbers. They're not hard. I do all this. Now, dental corporate never say this, but other corporates. Now, I've stood and worked at some level with just about every corporate in this country, just about every corporate in the UK. And there was one particularly famous case where I had all of the data in the whole domain. And I basically went through the model, and the CEO basically told me, we do all of this. And I said, but you have 80% utilisation, you have 50% record effectiveness, you have 5% fail to attend. The data says you're not. It didn't make any difference. The economy is down. Brian, don't you know about mining? The airline. The economy is terrible. We'll never. We can't be expected to maintain the same revenue levels. Yeah. In truth, attitude is everything. Times are more difficult. But if you do this, you will get the outcomes. That's it. It's easy. Okay, two case studies. Okay, three chair partnership annual. Three chair partnership practice south of England. Practice owners were happy. 73% utilisation, but worse than the average, 2% failed to attend, half the recalls turned up, which means that they did one letter. The average earnings in England is 180 pounds, 161, a little bit less. Every dentist worked 30 hours, they had 90 hours of billable time, 20% of it was lost, half a million pounds. Turns out a three chair practice, half a million pounds, it's very typical for Britain. We did a bunch of stuff. At three months, we did some more stuff to drive up the average value. First three months, we just drove up the traffic. Second three months, did stuff to get more value into the book. Three months later, 88% utilised. They didn't make 90%, which is not that hard, so they're still not doing that great. But they did get 81% recall effectiveness. Because they did three forms of media, it's 30 days each. It's pretty consistent. It's really not rocket science. Each data still worked six months later, 30 hours. They still had 90 hours of billable time, but they now built 88%. The hourly rate just went up a little bit to 189. What kind of effect would that have on a dental practice? Those simple changes. Would anyone like that? So we've run this formula kind of 400 times. It truly works. Okay, case study number two. One slide. Eight chair practice, really well run, really successful. We're going in to do the consultation, and I tagged along on this. This was in our early days of doing these. And in the car, we were saying, I don't think there's any point in going. I know this, I know it's well run. Principal was booked 92%, not at six weeks, but at 12 weeks. So, what do we know about that? <laughs> okay, Associate A, so he had a bunch of chairs, eight chairs. I'm picking out one of the associates now. A bunch of them were good. But Associate A, Ford cover was a fraction of the principal. Three-week cover was miserable. Principal 
principal has 75% record offence. He only sent one letter, so that's extraordinary. Patients were saying, I can't wait to get my recall so I can come to see him. We've never seen that. That's incredible. Associate A had 40% of his record returns. Now what's interesting is it was exactly the same system, the same letter and the same runs. I didn't separate them by associate or principal. It was all the same. So what's happening? Well, the first thing that's happening is all the new patients are going to see associate A because the principal's fully blocked. No one can get it. So the principal feels great, by the way. You know, I'm really in demand, I'm really busy. But 60% of Associate A's patients don't return. What's happening to all the restoration work in the practice? 60% of them. <coughs> it's all leaving. What's wrong? When we show the principal this data, the principal goes, oh, I know, he's awful. <coughs> okay, okay, well look, great news. We've got some language now that you can use to coach him. We've got some numbers that you can talk to him about. It's no longer just your gut feel about how he treats patients. What's the true cost? Because this is not just about money. What's the principal doing? The principal is spending all his time doing routine examination. He doesn't like the industry anymore. He's sick of it. What's happening to the practice growth? Nothing. Okay, it's me. Now, I think I'm out of time. Yeah. Okay, so if you've got questions, come see me at the back.